Colin Father Robert Lauder, a priest of the Diocese of Brooklyn, a professor of philosophy at St. John's University. And uh, I am going to uh, focus in today in this course on the Catholic novel on what may be the best Catholic novel in English about a priest. It is Graham Greene's masterpiece, The Power and the Glory. Now, let me give you a couple of, uh, just a little bit of background on Graham Greene. He, he was often an object of controversy. When I was in college, uh, a number of people thought he's, he, there's too much uh, reference to sex in, uh, in Greene's work. For example, in this particular novel, The Priest is not what we usually think of as a good priest. He has committed the sin of fornication, and he has, is, uh, the woman with whom he had sex has had a child. So he's had given birth to an illegitimate child, and he also has a serious drinking problem. So uh, how can that be the best novel about a priest? It can be because Graham Greene is such a great, great writer. By calling attention to the priest's flaws, Greene highlights the mystery of the priesthood. So in this, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here now. But if, if someone like this, someone who's, who seems to have committed these sins can be a priest, then this is a great sign of God's love touching absolutely everybody. Uh, I'll just, I'll just uh, share with you one humorous anecdote. Green had an audience with Pope Paul VI. And in the audience, Pope Paul VI said, told him how much he enjoyed the power and the glory. And Green said, oh, well, your holiness, a Vatican official condemned that book. <laughs> and Pope Paul said, oh, don't worry about that. He said, there are always going to be people who don't like your books. Uh, so I don't think, I, don't, I think by what's being written today, all of these books are pretty tame in, in, reference to their, in their references to sexuality. So what is this book about? What is the plot? It's about the last priest in Mexico, or at least in one section of Mexico. The church is under tremendous persecution. Green, for several years, tried to get an assignment to Mexico to write uh, a story about the anti-Catholicism, which he thought was the worst persecution of the church since Elizabethan times. He finally gets it. He goes down there, spends two months down there, and writes a book called The Lawless Road about his experience, and then writes this novel. And I and many critics would say, this is Graham Greene's masterpiece. Not one word is wasted. Uh, it is really tight, and it is really deep, I think. Uh, the first couple of pages, Green uh, paints the atmosphere. It's extremely humid. Uh, everything is dry. Uh, there are beetles on the ground. Uh, the, uh, the, the sun is, is, is coming down extremely, str very, very strongly. Uh, all of this, it, this the, uh, there's no sign of life, okay? And this is the the metaphor that Green is using when the church leaves. The church was the source of life, and now that the church has been persecuted, uh, the, the lands are kind of empty and dry and not fertile. Uh, this priest, every time the priest tries to escape to a safer part of Mexico, for example, he wants to get to a Vera Cruz, which of course means True Cross. And in a sense, the whole novel is his journey toward Vera Cruz. But every time he tries to escape, somebody comes to him and says, uh, a priest is needed, someone's dying or someone's sick, and they want to see a priest. So even though this priest believes he is in mortal sin, even though he, he wishes he could get to confession so he would be close to God again, he always opts to do what he, wants, what he should do as a priest. He forgets about himself and goes and risks his life to, to help somebody else. Now, that, he, of course, is the main character. There's another character in the book called Padre Jose who has apostatized. He has given up the faith and he is, and he is married. And he's, a, he's, a, his, he's really a heartbreaking character because he's a sign of ridicule to everybody. Everybody knows he was a priest and now they, they, uh, they ridicule him, they laugh at him and so on. Um, two other very important characters are a police lieutenant who is brought into communism brought up as a Catholic, but now he's brought into communism, and an American uh, bank robber and murderer, and, uh, and one other character, a mestizo who's kind of the Judas character. Uh, what Green does is he's always contrasting the priest with the, with the communist uh, lieutenant. The priest is not physically very attractive. He's a little guy. 
Uh, he's, he's got bulbous eyes. He, he, almost, he almost acts like he wants to disappear, you know. The, cat, the police lieutenant, the boots are shined, the belt is shined, so he's got his revolver. He, he, you have the feeling he wouldn't have time for sex. Uh, he's, he's celibate. He's totally dedicated to wiping out the church uh, because he believes the church is exploiting people. So you get these two characters. All, the green is contrasting them all along. And then the murderer, the, the uh, American murderer. In a very dramatic scene, uh, the mestizo, who you suspect is going to betray the priest to get the reward, comes to the priest and he says, Father, that, uh, that American who was wanted by the police has been shot. He's dying. He wants, he's a Catholic. He wants to see a priest. And the priest says something like, you must think I'm an awful fool. Obviously, this is a trap. I'm not going with you. And then the mestizo says uh, to the priest, here, he wrote you this note. And the priest opens the note, and he just reads the first uh, four words. And the first four words are, for Christ's sake, Father. He folds the note, and he goes back. And of course, it is a trap. When he gets there, the, 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 uh, pr the dying murderer who may have really written that note and who may have really wanted a priest, now, now is not interested. He's only interested in getting the priest away. Uh, Father, they're surrounding you. Here's a gun. Shoot your way out of here, okay? The priest begs him to go to confession, to say he's sorry for his sins, and the man dies not having gone to confession. So not only has the priest given up his life, he's given up his life apparently, you know, fruitlessly, that the person he was going to try to help lost interest. Then he is captured, the priest is captured, and I want to read oh, just one page. This is the day of the priest's execution. Uh, the night before, he has had a long discussion with the uh, police lieutenant. And you, the police lieutenant has, even though he hates the, he, he, he's, he's, he doesn't want this, he has a tremendous admiration for the priest. You know, that he gave his, that he's ready to give up his life, that he really is trying to help people. So it's, it's a very dramatic scene, but what I'm going to read to you is, the scene where the priest wakes up on the day of his, de of his execution. When he woke up, it was dawn. Three long taps and one, shot, one short one, and immediately the, the bugle taps began. He woke with a huge feeling of hope, which suddenly and completely left him at the first sight of the prison yard. It was the morning of his death. He crouched on the floor with the empty brandy flask in his hand, trying to remember an act of contrition. Oh God, I am sorry and beg pardon for all my sins. Crucified, worthy of thy dreadful punishments. He was confused. His mind was on other things. It was not the good death to which one always prayed. He caught sight of his own shadow on the cell wall. It had the look of surprise and grotesque unimportance. What a fool he had been to think that he was strong enough to stay when others fled. What an impossible fellow I am, he thought, and how useless. I have done nothing for anybody. I might just as well have never lived. His parents were dead. Soon he wouldn't even be a memory. Perhaps after all, he was not at the moment afraid of damnation. Even the fear of pain was in the background. He felt only an immense disappointment because he had to go to God empty-handed with nothing done at all. It seemed to him at that moment that it would have been quite easy to have been a saint it would only have needed a little self-restraint and a little courage. He felt like someone who has missed happiness by seconds at an appointed place. He knew now that at the end, there was only one thing that counted, to be a saint. Now, now I think that is great writing, really great writing. So I don't want to, I'm going to be trying, I'm going to try to be careful in these uh, during this course, not to tell you how any of these novels end, because I don't want to ruin them for you. I am hoping that uh, I've said enough about The Power and the Glory that you would be motivated to read it, or maybe even, t uh, and to read all the novels we're going to deal with. Uh, I, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Uh, I, I think, I, I've chosen them very carefully, and er everyone I've uh, taught anything about these novels to, no one has told me they've been disappointed, okay? Now, uh, the uh, priest, uh, 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 Green refers to him as a whiskey priest. So he has committed a sin of fornication and he is something of a drunkard. 
Interestingly, when he finally gets to the safe place, he slips back into his old ways. He's charging for confessions. <laughs> he's charging for baptisms. Uh, however, when the chips are down, when somebody needs a priest, then he rises to the occasion. So the question is this. Having committed this sin and not, not, not able to go to confession because all the other priests had left, what is his status? Is he, all, is he cut off from God or is he perhaps a saint? Remember Jesus' words, greater love than this no one has that he lay down his life for his friends. The priest did not have to go back and try to hear the dying man's confession. He did that freely. So isn't that an act of heroic courage? Okay, uh, you know, we're talking about a fictional character. So uh, I, 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 don't know what, I don't know whether he's a saint or not. And probably Graham Greene wouldn't know whether he's a saint or not. But I choose to, I choose to think he is. That, that that kind of courage would, would cause all his sins to be forgiven. Now, a dramatic scene like that is repeated in a number of these novels. When we, uh, we get to Even in Wars, Brides Had Revisited, I'm going to read to you a scene very similar to that. Uh, I hope I, when I do that, I can control myself because when, when I do it in class, I often fill up. It's so moving. Um, so there are many, many great novels. But I believe every one we're going to deal with in this course is, is one of them. It's a great novel. And every one of them is what I've described as a Catholic novel. So can God reveal himself, touch us, invite us into a love relationship through literature? Why not? Why not? We are all surrounded by God. And, and God is, is uh, the Holy Spirit is constantly spurring us and trying to motivate us. Uh, what would be a more obvious area than a Catholic story, it seems to me. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in, in teaching philosophy at St. John's University, I have to encourage book, uh, students to read difficult books. These novels are stories, and stories are just delightful to read. Mm -hmm.